Welcome back to Chicago Independent Television. The Federal Communications Commission is crafting policy of freedom of speech and action on the internet known as net neutrality. Chicago played host to a recent series of lectures on the topic. We'll now see the first of these series of lectures as an extended segment. What does the term network neutrality mean? A good definition is posted on the website of the man who first coined the term net neutrality, Tim Wu, a law professor at Columbia Law School in New York. Let me quote at length from a page at timwu.org, which is devoted to defining the term. Tim Wu writes, quote, Network neutrality is best defined as a network design principle. The idea is that a maximally useful public information network aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. This allows the network to carry every form of information and support every kind of application. The principle suggests that information networks are often more valuable when they are less specialized, when they are a platform for multiple uses, present and future. Note that this doesn't suggest every network has to be neutral to be useful. Discriminatory private networks can be extremely useful for other purposes. What the principle suggests is that there is such a thing as a neutral public network, which has a particular value that depends on its neutral nature. A useful way to understand this principle is to look at other networks, like the electric grid, which are implicitly built on a neutrality theory. The general purpose and neutral nature of the electric grid is one of the things that make it extremely useful. The electric grid does not care if you plug in a toaster, an iron, or a computer. Consequently, it has survived and supported giant waves of innovation in the appliance market. The electric grid that worked for the radios of the 1930s works for the flat screen TVs of today. For that reason, the electric grid is a model of a neutral innovation driving network. The theory behind the network neutrality principle, which the internet sometimes gets close to, is that a neutral network should be expected to deliver the most to a nation and the world economically by serving as an innovation platform, and socially by facilitating the widest variety of interactions between people. The internet isn't perfect, but it aspires for neutrality in its original design. Its decentralized and mostly neutral nature may account for its success as an economic engine and as a source for folk cult of folk culture." Unquote. Sounds great, right? A maximally useful public information network that aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. Sounds like something everyone would support, right? So if everyone would support it then, and this brings us to our second question, why is net neutrality necessary? It's necessary because net neutrality, as great as it sounds, is not universally supported. There are powerful entities that want to undo this maximally useful public information network to change it to something over which they can gain exclusive control and exclusive profit. These powerful entities in particular are large scale telephone and cable television providers, which have had a history of vertical integration with internet service providers and consolidation among themselves, where buyouts, mergers, and attrition result in fewer and fewer providers holding more and more of the market. In the phone market of the, of the United States, we are down at the time of recording these lectures in June 2014 to just four, er, to just four major providers, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, who combined command 90% of the telephony market in the United States. In the cable market in the United States, four firms, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Cox and Charter combine to command 62% of the cable television industry's revenue. And that concentration is worse when you look at it from the perspective of, of individual consumers. I mentioned that there are a handful of cable TV and telephone companies holding most of the market share. But 20% of American households have just one internet service provider. And of the 80, remaining 80%, more than 96% of those remaining 80% have at most two providers, a monopoly cable TV provider or a monopoly telephone provider. This concentration affects, or potentially affects, the, the internet and network neutrality in the following way. If an internet service provider in a more diverse market would not behave in a neutral fashion, 
That is, if an internet service provider would, for example, start to slow down or block outright unaffiliated content or access to content, unless folks paid more for that content, if that were to happen, then an unsatisfied consumer in a diverse market would simply switch to a different internet service provider that didn't behave so badly. But in a monopoly or in a duopoly where parties behave like mobsters and make switching to another provider difficult or impossible, then the internet service provider has that leverage and can use it to fleece customers or degrade content or worse. Net neutrality, then, is a matter of bringing a measure of public accountability to these private shakedown artists. We, as a society, are largely unable or unwilling to take on these monopolies or duopolies. The concentrations of power and the expected consequences of markets, about which we will discuss in greater depth in a later lecture. But those private tyrannies are, in the case of the internet, nonetheless performing a public service. Historically, when that happens, when something private fulfills a public good, that falls under a practice, a practice and set of rules referred to as common carriage, with such parties being common carriers and net neutrality being an extension of that tradition of law and practice pertaining to the internet. There are and have been claims by some people, often officials who are affiliated with the Republican Party, who claim and have claimed that, a network, that network neutrality is just additional bureaucratic red tape, a solution looking for a problem. For example, Federal Communications Commissioner Michael O'Reilly says that net neutrality in any form is, quote, unnecessary and defective, unquote, and doubts that, quote, there, there is an actual problem resulting in real harm to consumers, unquote. In actuality, there have been a number of cases of violations that can be construed as violations of neutrality on the internet, and that can illustrate specifically what could come to happen if net neutrality were to end. Before we dive into specific examples of network neutrality violations, it would be useful to note what forms such might violations might take. Again, Tim Wu, the gentleman who coined the term network neutrality, offers a list of four potential violations of network neutrality, which we'll describe briefly. Violation number one, blocking. And that service providers simply block anyone or anything they don't like. Violation number two, what's called termination monopoly pricing. Another way of saying that internet service providers can charge excessive fees to content producers or content consumers who wish to gain access to users. Violation number three, what's called playing favorites, also called most favored network violations. This is where internet service providers don't block but instead prioritize applications and content which they like and deprioritize that which they don't. And violation number four, transparency failures. This is when internet service providers don't say everything that they know to content providers and content to consumers, not just about the service options of what's available, but also about details of the state of the internet at any particular time. So, Commissioner O'Reilly says that net neutrality advocates fail to make the case that there's an actual problem resulting in real harm to consumers. It turns out that there are, already, on the record, instances of internet service providers who have already kicked the network neutrality hornet's nest in each of these four violation examples. Let's go through them again in turn. Violation number one, blocking. There are a number of instances in which internet service providers have been caught blocking content. In 2007, Verizon declined a request from NARAL Pro-Choice America to carry text messages. And AT&T muted some politically charged lyrics during a live stream of the musical group Pearl Jam at Lollapalooza. In both instances, AT&T and Verizon backtracked on those actions and addressed concerns voiced by Pearl Jam and NARAL. But nevertheless, blocking did happen. And that highlights the very real concern of potential abuse should net neutrality be abolished. Violation number two, termination monopoly pricing. In December 2013, Comcast began to throttle internet traffic generated by the streaming video service Netflix. Traffic improved after Netflix and Comcast in February 2014 agreed to a, quote, mutually beneficial interconnection agreement, unquote, even though, quote, terms of the agreement are not being disclosed, unquote. Indeed, there's a video segment on the HBO TV series Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, 
where they track the traveling throttling of traffic of that Netflix deal with Comcast and demonstrate the connection between the two. What's more, reports have since floated that a deal between Netflix and Verizon resulted in no noticeable speed improvement for Netflix customers using Verizon. Violation number three, playing favorites. In 2007, Comcast was caught deprioritizing content that used the internet protocol BitTorrent, a set of digital rules, a protocol, that's particularly useful for transferring very large files across the internet. BitTorrent is enormously popular and widely used. It accounts, by some estimates, for as much as a third of all internet traffic. BitTorrent is widely used for movie and TV show sharing, what's sometimes called content piracy. And Comcast got caught in selectively interfering with BitTorrent downloads by Comcast customers. But Comcast was not caught by the FCC or by rival companies, but by investigators aligned with outsiders, most notably the nonprofit groups Public Knowledge and the Electronic Freedom Foundation. Comcast didn't make what they did readily apparent, which also makes it an example of violation number four, transparency failures. The violation was discovered after the fact. Another example of such a transparency failure is the degrading or blocking of voice over IP calls across mobile telephone networks. Such transparency failures are often explained away as measures to address security concerns. So we see a definition of what net neutrality is, we have a description of ways it's violated, and we have concrete examples of ways in which it has been violated. So let's assume the worst case scenario. Suppose that the provisions regarding network neutrality on the internet are abolished, and that the big internet service providers, particularly the big phone and big cable TV companies, have free reign to carry out the violations we outlined. What then? What would the end result look like? What's most likely to happen? Internet service providers in the United States would now be able to legally to block, gouge producers and consumers, play favorites, and not be transparent in revealing the details of their actions. Presumably, given the profile the issue has gotten, those internet service providers would, as a concession, maintain a policy of neutrality, perhaps for a number of years, until the issue itself would presumably die down over time. Comcast, for example, has agreed to abide by net neutrality uh, policies until 2018 as a concession to their buyout of NBC Universal. But after that, net neutrality, barring no other changes, will be formally ended. The policy fights will have been concluded, the policy will now be in place, the legal recourses in the courts will have been exhausted, and organized money will have defeated organized people regarding internet policy with no going back. ISPs have ended their concession to abide by net neutrality, or they will have done so, and they will begin acting in their interests. They'll begin to increase their costs for usage and for providing content. And those costs are being applied more widely. Only the wealthiest producers can maintain their access uh, to content, while users will have their content options reduced markedly. There are graphics online that envision what this would look like, taking the form of mock advertisements. For example, in one such mock ad from the fictional company Telco ADSL, you get starting internet access at, 20, at $29.95 per month, accompanied by the very legal small print known as mouse type, which says, includes 500 megabytes of free transfers to non-peering websites at full speed, limited to 120 kilobits per second thereafter. In other words, you can have access for a limited amount, and then the internet would only be available at extremely slow speeds. The ad imagines a variety of optional tiers for things like international news, domestic news, music, online gaming, online retailers, and social networks. Each of these tiers carries an additional price of $5 to $10 per month. Mind you, by current Chicago standards, even these imagined inflated prices would be lower than what we currently pay. So let's increase the cost to, say, $200 per month for basic access with tiers at $25 to $50 per tier per month. Any sites or resources by activists, nonprofits, and small-scale companies, which are not in these commercially approved bundles, would be counted against your download quota, would be available but only at exceedingly slow speeds, or perhaps blocked entirely, and if there would be no way to address these problems. If this sounds eerily like the current arrangement of cable television, it's not a coincidence. 
Cable TV providers also rank among the major internet service providers. Providers. Telephone providers are also getting into the act with their own clones of cable television, like Verizon's Fios and AT&T's Uverse. What's more, with their bundles of cable television channels available in these subscription platforms, what you get now with cable television eerily resembles what is envisioned with the internet later, if net neutrality is abolished. There are serious policy reasons why now we are in a now or never situation regarding the internet. These are tied into the history of the internet, with key implications to future policy and future crafting of how the internet works. We'll explore that history and how it ties into a key FCC vote in 2014 in our next lecture.